Faculty at Fresno, we're like, what's your decon procedure? Hey, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Um, it's time for us to do our second live streamed event uh, from the beautiful studios of MRAP here in Los Angeles. Before we uh, do anything else, uh, let me remind you that uh, there's a chat room down there, play nice. Um, also, because of the tech, if something goes wrong, give us about five minutes. Uh, we'll reboot the machine and then uh, we'll come back. The internet is being hammered by Netflix and everybody at home bored, so sometimes the streaming quality may dip down. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, like I say, if there's a problem, uh, we'll sort of jump back on. I'm going to give you a little introduction, but before I do that, I just want to introduce our players tonight. Uh, we've got uh, Professor Dave Talon. Dave, say hi. Nice to be back. Excellent. Uh, I've got uh, Professor Dave Schreiger, also from UCLA, and he's the editor of the Annals of Emergency Medicine, our associate editor, and of JAMA. Dave, say hi. Hello. And we've got Jess Mason, who you all know, who's one of the editors at MRAP and is also on the front lines looking after patients right now. Say hi, Jess. Hello. Good evening. Great. So uh, before I talk to these lovely people, let me um, just tell you a few things about what's going on at MRAP. So at MRAP, we now have that banner up the top. I don't know if you've seen it. It's on mobile. It's on um, the main site. It's resources. And if you click on that puppy, it'll take you to all of the audio that we've been doing, the um, um, updates, the video updates, the audio updates, the Corpendium chapter, which is all of this stuff is free and open access. There's stuff there for residencies as well that Jess has predominantly been putting together for you. If you're a residency to just want to jump in and uh, have sort of spoon-fed rounds for you because you're so busy looking after all these patients. So go check out this resource. Everything there is free and open access. And as I say, we're doing um, breaking news segments for the primary care group as well as the emergency medicine group. And uh, we're also posting a lot of videos like this flattening the curve that we did yesterday, an animation by Josh K, which is really spectacular. The textbook is literally being updated every day. We are continuously reviewing the literature. Uh, Jess and I are writing this and Stuart and Amal are all over it. We have other experts in particular areas going into this. So this is uh, updated at least once a day right now. We'll continue to do that as we get more information. It's sort of become some of our uh, full-time jobs, which is kind of weird. Now, before I start talking about all the controversial things we have here, I just want to show you this tweet this is a tweet from a Puyd's Emergency Medicine and Doc, and she's there with her husband in the background, and uh, they're out there looking after these uh, patients and each other, just like you, and I just want to say to all of you, I know that this is a really stressful time. This disease is bad. Some of you are going to get sick. Some emergency physicians are already sick, but if you're not there, people will die, and they'll die in huge numbers, and so we that aren't there on the front lines with you, thank you for your work. Um, it's really important. Um, and if you uh, wash and if you don and if you do everything correctly, your chance of getting sick is pretty low. We've seen that from the Hong Kong experience. So be anal retentive, look after yourselves. And at the end, we're going to talk about how you can protect your family. So you go to work and you get exposed. How can you reduce infection to your family? So we'll talk about that more at the end. This was just from this morning, obviously. Uh, we're still at the uh, giant upslope of this. The good news today, we heard that in China that they've had no new cases in China, there's been a few that have been imported, but in China, they have completely shut this thing down with social distancing as only uh, China could possibly do. And in Wuhan, they are starting to let people uh, come out. Obviously, this is a dangerous time for them as well that you could get a second wave, but it shows that by aggressive measures that you can actually uh, shut this thing down or slow it way down. You can really flatten the curve. And this is really important news. We got some data yesterday from the CDC about what's happening here in the United States. This is the first data that we've seen. We've uh, had case fatality data and ICU data from other countries. And so now we have it for the US and it's looking very similar to the data that was coming out of China. The overall case fatality rate, somewhere between 1.8 and about three-ish percent, predominantly in the elderly. Uh, very few deaths in uh, the young population under 19 so far. They've had no deaths. But that's not to say that uh, young people don't get sick. 
in the 20 to 44 year age group, there was about a 15 to 20 percent admission rate. Now, we don't know exactly what the denominator of that is because we haven't done a lot of testing. This was done between February 12th and March 16th. So the denominator is probably lower than that. But young people will get sick. And that's an important thing that you're hearing on the news outlets. Young people uh, should not be going out there and they should be doing social distancing because you can and will get the virus and uh, you can get sick, but also you can make the elderly population sick. So do the right thing. Get it away from each other. Do the social distancing. Please do that stuff. Wash your hands. You are not immune from this. And there's reports of younger people who have recovered from this virus, but with significant uh, reductions in pulmonary function. So you do not want that either. So it's in, within your interest as well um, to not get sick with this disorder. There's also a lot of problems, obviously, here in the United States with supplies, with N95s, with gowns and gloves and all this stuff. Uh, there's links in the textbook. Um, to some strategies that the uh, CDC is suggesting. We'll talk to Dave more about that. But uh, we can extend the use of some of these uh, masks. We can reuse some of these masks in a reasonable fashion. And obviously, we need to get a lot more of them. So I'm going to bring in Jess Mesa right now to talk about um, one of the most controversial aspects of what's going on. We've been hearing that non and ACE and ARBs might make patients worse. So Jess, uh, you've been looking at this a lot for the textbook. What's the spiel? Okay, first I'm going to give you the answer and then I'm going to give you the reasoning. So the answer is that for both NSAIDs and ACE inhibitors and ARBs, right now the data does not support discontinuing using them in patients when it's needed. And so where did this even come from? And I should mention that we also released on MRAP some audio today in a breaking news segment where Sean Nort gives a really nice explanation of this as well. So this all came recently from a tweet from the French health minister who warned against using NSAIDs. And he got this idea from, uh, there was a publication in Lancet Respiratory Medicine that made this suggestion that patients who have diabetes and hypertension, they have a higher risk of getting a more severe form of the COVID illness. Now, why is this? So we know that the, the virus, which is SARS-CoV-2, that's what causes COVID-19, this virus binds at the ACE2, on ACE2 receptors in cells. Um, and so what causes increases in this ACE2 receptor? Various things. Some of them potentially are ACE inhibitors, ARBs, things like glitazones, which is why a lot of patients who are on uh, diabetes medications may possibly have this increased expression of ACE2 receptors, and also potentially NSAIDs. So here we have this hypothesis, which you know is, is based on something that makes sense. You're taking something or you have a condition that increases your expression of ACE2 receptors, and that is the binding site for the virus. So it makes sense, you know, this could potentially cause a more severe form of the disease. And how long do you have to be on those medications to cause that upregulation? No one knows. Usually people aren't on ibuprofen for prolonged periods of time. So who knows how much of an effect that may or may not even have. So the thing is though, this is all speculation. We don't know, we don't have any studies to validate whether or not this hypothesis has much merit to it. And so just yesterday, the WHO uh, sent out a tweet saying that they do not recommend against using NSAIDs and knows of, of no available data on this topic. With regard specifically to ACE inhibitors, there was a joint statement that came out from the American Heart Association, the Heart Failure Society of America, and the American College of Cardiology. And they just said, there are no experimental or clinical data demonstrating beneficial or adverse outcomes among COVID-19 patients using ACE inhibitors or ARB medications. So that, so patients are gonna stay on them for now until we know, because there's probably more benefit in staying on them than, on, than there is risk. And actually, the European Society of Cardiology posted a statement that ACE inhibitors and ARBs may actually be protective. And this is based on data from animal studies, no human studies. So it's a big question mark. We don't know. We don't have a lot of good information to, to make a conclusion on this right now. I think it's a very interesting time. It's a scary time. And because this virus is so scary and so global and so sudden, People are really pulling at straws to try to find anything that could potentially be helpful. So I think we're seeing an example of a couple of phenomena at play here. One of them is this massive retrospective analysis of data, just fishing for any sort of association. And when you do that enough, you're going to find an association. 
And who knows whether or not there's anything causal there, but you will find associations. Who knows if it's chance or not? I'm told this is a Schreiger-ish type of statement to make. Um, so we're desperate to look for any sort of association. And then you fuel that fire with social media, latching onto this one statement, it blows up, it gets totally out of control and spreads that idea. So right now it's too soon to know, more data is needed. NSAIDs are probably okay for short courses, but I would say, you know, if we start heading in the direction of finding out that maybe they do cause some harm, I think most people are going to lean towards treating fevers with acetaminophen and paracetamol. Um, and if that's the case right now, if you're taking care of a non-COVID patient and you can give them ibuprofen, do that. So that way we're saving the acetaminophen and paracetamol for down the road if we're leaning towards using that in more of our COVID patients. And for the ACEs and ARBs, I would say leave that to the primary care physicians um, for now, patients should be staying on them. They're on them for good reason. That's a great review. I uh, talked to Heidi James, who's uh, one of the MRAP faculty who's in primary care, and she forwarded me all of those things from Europe, from Canada, from Australia, from the US, and all of the associations are saying the same thing. Just keep them on them. It's just as likely to help you as hurt you. So everybody move to your corners for now. So now let's talk about uh, testing. You know, last time we spoke, which was just a week ago, uh, we talked about um, testing. Tests are now much more available. And I wanted to bring in um, Dave Schreiger on this because he sent me from uh, JAMA, where he's one of the editors there, a paper that was just released a couple of days ago of 18 patients in the hospital where they did PCR testing every day for 18 days. And I'm going to show the slide here. You might not be able to see it very well, but these are the 18 patients and uh, sometimes they're testing positive and sometimes they're testing negative and they did a lot of these tests day after day after day and Dave can you tell us what you think the implications of this small group of patients is from Singapore? Certainly so there, there are a couple issues here one is they seem to be using the same type of test that everybody else is which is an RNA amplification PCR test and this is a hospital that uh, you know was organized enough to do this study and is supposedly an excellent hospital in terms of the quality of their work. And what they show is for these 18 patients, all of whom uh, you know, tested positive and then were hospitalized, most of whom had minimal symptoms, minimal oxygen requirements, and, and, went, and, and all of whom survived and all of whom went home and only two uh, went to the ICU. But as they're tested almost every day, and again, I, I can't see the graphic mail, but I assume that the audience is. And if they are, and if the resolution is good enough, you'll see a small circle in every cell and a white circle means that no test was conducted that day. A red circle means that the test was conducted and was positive. And a green circle means the test was conducted and was negative. And what you see almost for every patient is that intermixed between positive days are negative days. And of course, we could, we could comment on why that might be the case. The sample might have been, not have been acquired properly. I doubt patients are shedding, not shedding, shedding, not shedding, but we can't rule that out at this point. Or there could be a problem with the test. But whatever those things are, if the test is that unreliable, assuming that these people were continuously positive between their extreme positive tests, that suggests that a single negative test is certainly not sufficient to say, if you had it, you no longer have it. And if you don't have it, you don't have it, or you're not going to get it. So I think we have to be very careful about what the meaning of a single negative test is, because there's really no data yet on what the actual sensitivity and specificity of this test is. And we simply don't know how many false negatives we're going to see as we use this test. And what, you know, if one thinks about it this way, you have a patient who's sick enough to get the test, assuming they're not just getting it for pure epidemiologic sampling reasons. You have a patient who's, or if you're a healthcare worker who's potentially been exposed, but for patients who are getting it for clinical reasons, if you're sick enough to get the test, regardless of whether it's positive or negative, you should be isolating yourself because whether you have this particular virus or some other virus or disease, you still should be isolating yourself from elderly people, from other vulnerable populations. So I think everyone's clamoring, we need more tests, we need more tests. We certainly need that for epidemiologic reasons, but this notion that people need to be tested so they can see that they're negative, I'm not sure I fully believe that, especially when we don't know what the sensitivity of the test is. Yeah, so there's ongoing questions about the sensitivity and the specificity of this test. Uh, the estimates is that it's about 75%. This is just another example of that. It's certainly not 100%, and it could be sampling. It could be something else. But Dave, uh, you're an out-of-the-box thinker, and we've been talking the last few days, and you're 
pretty sure that this uh, testing that we're doing right now, that you're seeing on TV, that all this push to get lots of tests, test, 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 you hear it all the time, might be the stupidest thing in the world. Can you explain why? Certainly I can, once I figure out where the unmute button is. Sorry about that. Um, so my concern is this. Um, for all of the walking well who are coming to the, not well, I shouldn't say well, but all the patients who don't need to be admitted. So they're, they have a fever, they have a cough, they're coming to the emergency department or anywhere else for that matter and uh, to get tested. And what that means is that somewhere some health per care personnel, and particularly in the ER, at least in my department, we're taking this seriously and we're gowning and, and, and wearing appropriate uh, equipment, which means that for every patient, we're burning through a gown, a mask, gloves, and possibly um, some eye protective equipment as well. So that means for every test we're doing, we're wasting all those resources, both human resources in terms of the physician's time and all these physical resources, which we may need if, when, when I'm gonna say things get busier for acutely ill patients. So my point is, we don't have a treatment we're offering when someone's positive as long as they're well. So why not say to people, check your pulse ox. There could be a pulse ox stand with a cleaner. You clean your finger, you clean the device, you put your finger in it. If your pulse ox is over 95, you go home and you self-isolate. Done. No ER visit, no testing. You just stay home. Obviously, there would be exceptions for people who do critical jobs, healthcare workers and the like. We would unburden our ERs. We would free up our ER doctors. They're already stressed to um, have less of a total volume, less to do, so they can really concentrate on taking care of themselves and taking care of the sicker patients. And we would save the tests so we can really repeat the tests on healthcare workers to make sure they're truly negative and save all of that equipment. Yeah, so that's a, a little bit different take than uh, you're hearing from everybody else. Um, I'm just watching the chat room here and a couple of questions. Uh, one of them was, can you test positive after you've uh, gotten better? And we know from China that you absolutely can. Um, people were testing positive for up to two weeks after they clinically got better, and it's not clear what was that from. Have you killed the virus? And these things are very sensitive in terms of uh, they can amplify any piece of DNA. So if you still got a little bit of dead virus DNA, you might still be testing positive. So we're not exactly sure what to do with that information. And then some other questions about the IgG, IgM uh, response. There are tests for that, but I have not seen that these are available widely yet. So I don't know where we are with that. Um, Dave uh, Talon might know about that. I don't know. Uh, what's happening with IgM, IgG? Do you know, Dave? Um, I don't know. I think they're the greater focus is helping identify people who are infected, not who've recovered from infection. But maybe as we get into serum, convalescent serum therapy, that'll be important. And it'll be nice to have seroprevalence studies like we had with SARS-1 to get an idea of, of the denominator of all the people who were infected and, and what proportion of them had symptomatic disease or had bad outcomes. I do want to say that one thing that's going to happen soon is that we're going to have rapid point of care COVID testing. Um, and so that's going to make it easier to do that testing and not jam up the emergency room. In fact, there's, there's even companies coming out with tests that could be done like a point of care test that doesn't require even sending it to the lab like a pregnancy test. So I think that's going to change uh, the equation a little bit. And I, I think with regard to what Dave is saying, you know, um, maybe we don't need to test the typical healthy person um, uh, or someone who's not severely ill who we could send home and not admit. But I think there's two considerations. One is the vulnerable population of elderly. I think if any of you uh, listen to the uh, JAMA uh, podcast, from uh, one of the infectious disease doctors up there. One of the things that he described was, we sort of had this idea from looking at this quite variable and long incubation period um, from the results in China, that this sort of rolled in slowly, this illness. You start out with a sore throat and a fever, and then you became more and more sick, including extremely sick over a longer period of time, several days. And what he said was, there were some patients who one day were well, and then the next day they were in the ICU. So I, it may be important to test uh, uh, vulnerable populations because this virus behaves differently than the flu. It behaves differently than metanumavirus or adenovirus. 
just to give them an idea of how carefully they should keep an eye on themselves and their loved ones who watch them, okay? And then this, the second group where it might be helpful is like we're talking about the pitchers, the, but we need to know about the catchers, who, the, who people live with when we do send them home. And if they live with vulnerable people, just like we get questions, Mel, uh, you know, from our colleagues, emergency physicians, about what they should do if they think they may get exposed and uh, with their family and do they need to get a hotel room or something like that. You know, these are decisions where you can do more or less to reduce risk. And if you live in a single room apartment with your older mother who has metastatic breast cancer, uh, you, you may that information about whether or not you're carrying and could transmit COVID-19 as opposed to uh, rhinovirus, you know, that might be important in your decision making. So I think there's a I think what Dave says is right, but I think there's a few exceptions to this. And I think as rapid testing gets online, um, you know, we may, may have more liberty to more uh, liberally test people. Yeah, I'm concerned about this um uh, we're going to give tests for everybody, tests for everybody. Uh, I agree with both of you. The first group of people that need these tests are the healthcare workers and the people that work in the hospitals. They're the people we really need to be screening for when they can go, when they can come back to work, that kind of thing. And if we use them all up on the worried well, people that are not going to need any intervention at all, that would be a tragedy. Can you just explain though a little bit more about, the? is there a test coming that you actually do at home like a pregnancy test? I just swab myself and it turns blue and I'm good or it turns black and I'm not? Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Yes. I mean, what would be ideal is if like at the airport, remember those wands? You could like wand somebody and you could say whether they're COVID positive or not. We won't get to that, uh, although there are some interesting new technologies that are being tested. But we will have, you know, like pregnancy tests, they've even talked about uh, making this available at home. So we may get quite a bit of data on the prevalence of COVID-19 and how the epidemiology changes. I don't, I'm not sure that that's necessary uh, to track the disease. I mean, I think there's a, absolutely, there's a, a constant proportion of the population who will get very ill and we will test those people and they'll be like the canaries in the coal mine. I, it's probably sufficient. Um, but I think there are other considerations because, you know, uh, people who are well also come into contact with very vulnerable people. It's not just healthcare workers. It's people who work, who work at convalescent homes who aren't nurses, who aren't doctors, but, you know, who clean up or, or uh, you, know, uh, you know, help with activities and things like that. Well, I want to go to Jess again. Uh, Jess, can you tell us, because uh, you're out there, you're on the front lines, uh, you're writing the textbook, but you're also seeing the patients. Can you tell us um, what the process is at Fresno? So you're at UCSF Fresno at the Big County Hospital there. How are you looking after all these patients coming in for testing and screening? And just give us, give us some color around what's going on there. Absolutely. So I'm obviously not the medical director there, but working there, I can describe what our triage process is like. If you are a patient and you're coming into our emergency department, before you can even get in through the door, you will be triaged by a nurse who will ask you some screening questions and they'll ask you for whether or not you have any symptoms um, that could possibly be coronavirus symptoms. And then also they'll ask about travel history. Now Fresno only has three current documented cases of COVID-19 as of today. And all three of them are travelers who have come from other places and come back to Fresno. So we have no documented cases right now of community transmission. Um, and so we're only testing people that both have symptoms and they've traveled to what we consider to be a hot spot. And what we're considering to be a hot spot is anywhere that has more than 10 confirmed cases. So pretty low threshold. Um, so that actually screens in a lot of people. And if you meet that criteria, you get sent to a tent. And if you don't meet that criteria, you can come into the regular lobby of the emergency department for your standard workup and assessment. If you make it over to the tent, that's being uh, staffed right now with mostly uh, nurses and techs. And um, we have iPads set up there. There's a couple of iPads on wheels and there's a station in the ER that one of us can go into a separate room and call in using FaceTime. So we don't even have to go into the tent, which is really fantastic because 
a lot of these patients, you can make the decision swab or not swab just based off of talking to them, getting a history and just, um, you know, you can comment on quite a few things about their examination. Uh, you can comment on things like, are they, have they looked, do they look distressed? Are they speaking in full sentences? You can comment on their vital signs, sort of the quote unquote, no touch physical exam. So you can still write a note and do everything that you would normally do. Um, and in, in many cases, I'd say most of the time, make that decision, discharge them straight from the tent. So those patients are never even going into the emergency department. And we usually are not having to go into the tent unless we make that decision that we wanna go in. If we go into the tent, what does that PPE look like? So before we walk in, we're doing the full donning of, of all of the typical recommended stuff. So we're doing the long sleeve gown, the gloves. Um, we are wearing N95 masks and we are wearing goggles that seal around the face. Going into the tent, doing your assessment. And if you're gonna see multiple patients, the decision that we've made right now, and again, this is gonna be institution dependent. So this is just what we're doing at the moment. Um, if you're going to see another patient, we are changing gloves, That's hand sanitizing, putting on new gloves. If you feel that any portion of your PPE has been contaminated, you go out and you fully doff and redon new um, personal protective equipment before you go back in. So we're trying, you know, this is, this is I think, a, a fair way of looking at this and trying to reduce the amount of equipment that we're going through, because if you're going to be in there for a while, we would go through so much equipment if we were constantly redoing the full PPE. We would burn through all of our supplies so fast. Um, maybe to you, uh, Dave Schreiger, what about the MTLA implications of um, an idea of doing sort of telemedicine? Even before they get to the emergency department, even before they get to your magic pulse ox, just having people call them on the phone um, and saying, okay, give me your symptoms. Yep, you're fine. Stay at home. Are there implications for that? I know that there are some laws being passed to protect large industries at this time, and I know that ASIP is pushing to have emergency physicians protected from malpractice, but do you want to speak to that? Right. So there are a couple of separate issues. One is, um, you know, can you bill for a telemedicine consult of this type when that wasn't the standard? And, and the fact is, some legislation's already been, you know, CMS and people have said that's okay. So they're allowing telemedicine. The other question is, though, do you need to do what would be considered a medical screening exam at all. So what I propose, one could argue, you know, getting a pulse ox and saying go away is not a medical screening exam. So that would be a, theoretically an EMTALA violation. And um, I don't think that problem has yet been fully solved in the sense of uh, if someone actually shows up at the door to the ER, can you get away with doing something short of what would be considered a screening exam? And I guess if you're using telemedicine, I think that's now acceptable. The question is, you know, where is the line between those two? How much do you have to do uh, to make it an official medical screening exam? And I mean, even registration. Do you want to have a registration personnel have to interact face to face with the patient? Or is it OK just to get have them take a picture of their driver's license and send it to you or, or, or something of that equivalent? So you have a record of who it was and you just leave it at that. I think these things have to be worked out, but I think they need to be worked out quickly because I think. You know, even in, 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 the, in the intelligence system that you described, Jess, um, I, I'm concerned that we're still using up too much human capital on the wrong part of the problem and, and whatever equipment that you are using. All right. Well, there's much more to talk about that. Let me just uh, stay, say one thing. There's a, a question here about are you dividing into respiratory and non-respiratory patients? I know that in Italy, they uh, certainly did that. They, if you had any respiratory symptoms, if uh, you're at all concerned about COVID, you went over there to this part of the hospital. And if you didn't, you went over to this part of the hospital. They went even further and they turned entire hospitals into that's where you go to that hospital if you have respiratory symptoms and this hospital if you've just got your heart attack or stroke. So that seems uh, quite a reasonable thing. Again, trying to keep the infectious away from the non-infectious. I want to talk about uh, co-infection now. So the, a lot of this will go towards Dave Tallon. Uh, we talked last week about the fact that if you uh, had respiratory symptoms and I did a flu test and it was positive, the chance of that it would be COVID-19 must be significantly less. We were using numbers like 2%. There's this study uh, from China, which came out um, soon after we did that live event last week, that suggests that maybe the co-infection rate is about 6%, if you can show the slide so that we can show that data, um, that maybe as many as 6% of these people could be uh, COVID positive. So uh, that's concerning enough. But then there was another study, which I really don't know what to do with, that suggested in the critically ill patients, 
that there was IgM, IgG evidence that maybe 20 to 80% of the critically ill patients had co-infection. I don't know what to do with that information. So Dave, does a 6% co-infection rate change the way you might use a flu test to rule people out? Or does that still mean that if your respiratory symptoms flu positive, you're still less likely to have COVID-19? Well, I, I think we've seen before COVID-19 that um, co-infection with respiratory viruses, um, like in the winter months, is common. So I think it's something that we would expect. Uh, you know, we're learning about the epidemiology of COVID-19 um, as we go along here, but it it's becoming common and we still are in the middle of the flu epidemic, although the flu cases are going down. So it's it's it would be expected that you will find people who are co-infected. The second thing is if we're using PCR technology, Mel, you know, you're going to detect evidence of viral targets uh, for sometimes over two weeks, uh, even though there's no active infection. So you could have had one infection with the flu and then had a COVID infection and detect both, even though the active infection, you know, might be COVID-19. These are, you know, very, very sensitive tests. Um, I think just looking at the numbers, it would be reassuring if you got tested, let's say with a multiplex respiratory panel, uh, which, I, which I think right now are, are useful. Um, you would, if you were positive for another respiratory virus, it's much less likely that you have COVID-19, but it's, it's still possible. And when we have COVID-19 testing, um, one COVID-19 test would also make it much less likely. But as we talked about at the beginning, one test isn't sufficient to say that you absolutely don't have COVID-19 infection. So, so I do think those things are helpful. Um, I, I think multiplex respiratory panels have been useful, um, especially for people who get admitted to the hospital because infection control is is important with COVID-19, but it's also important with flu and other respiratory viruses. Okay. Um, a question no, here, which one's... is a pretty good one maybe for you, Dave. Um, if we send these patients home and they want to go back to work, when are they safe to go back to work? You've said that the PCR testing can be positive for a couple of weeks. We saw that in China, but their symptoms have gone away. I think the current CDC guidance is two weeks after you feel better, but uh, do you have any opinion there? Yeah, not quite. I think what the CDC says is you can do a testing-based or clinical-based strategy um, to dis decide if it's safe for a healthcare worker to go back to work. And the testing strategy is your the fever is resolved or it's not there anymore. The respiratory symptoms are improving um, and you have two negative PCR tests 24 hours apart at least. And the alternative would be the fever is resolved, the respiratory symptoms are improving and you're greater than, uh, and the fever's been gone for three days and it's greater than. Oh, Dave, we lost your audio. Dang it, dang it. Right when it was, he was getting to the good bit. We'll come back to that question it, then. Uh, Mel, in the meantime, real quick. Yeah. Um, I just want to point out the two papers you referred to are both on preprint servers. They have not been peer reviewed and they're not published. And, you know, one of the dangers here is that there are literally hundreds of papers uh, being posted on preprint servers and being sent to the journals right now. And uh, it's a difficult task for the journals to sort out um, the, the articles that are most likely to be true from um, all the articles that may have significant problems. And one of the dangers of mining these preprint servers is that uh, we really don't know how good these papers are because they haven't been subjected to peer review and um, we just don't know the value of that information. Yeah, that's a very good point that uh, we should uh, s state very clearly. Both the CDC here in the US, the CDC in China is for any uh, publicly funded study is putting that information out there before it's peer reviewed. And uh, that is potentially dangerous, although at a time like this, you can't go through the normal process. So just understand that that's very preliminary. It's also true that uh, some of the pre-printed 
uh, pre-released, pre-peer-reviewed stuff from China is very difficult to read because it hasn't gone through that journal editing and has a, a layer of sort of English language over it. So some of them I just couldn't understand exactly what was trying to be said there. So um, Dave Talon, just keep yelling into your mic and playing with it. And at the point uh, we pick you up, we'll let you know. So uh, let's talk about treatment options. This study just was released yesterday in the New England Journal, about 199 patients who were uh, given uh, this HIV drug. We were hoping that this would be wonderful and uh, fix people. But um, in this study where they looked at, and I think Dave Shruggy, you can answer this, they looked at a pretty aggressive endpoint, like they got better uh, within uh, seven days or eight days compared to the other group. They found no benefit, but you're not so sure that there isn't a benefit. Right. So this is, you know, one of the difficult tasks of looking at a paper that's been set up from a frequentist perspective, which is you do a power calculation based on some desired difference you want to see. And in this case, they chose an eight day improvement in the patient's course. So the patients would be ready to go home from the hospital or would be better eight days sooner, given this cocktail of drugs. That's a really, really long, big difference to see. You know, we give people Tamiflu on the hope that it shortens their course of flu by a couple of hours or a day at most. And here we're looking for an eight day difference. So the fact that it's a negative study, it's a negative study for an eight day difference. That's how it was powered. When you look at a variety of the other outcomes of the study, they all seem to line up slightly or somewhat in the favor of this retroviral drug treatment. So the question then becomes, I mean, clearly it's not like magic because it, you would see different results if you gave it and everybody got better instantly. But for, to say that this negative study means these drugs have no benefit would, would be a misstatement. And all we can say right now is that it requires additional study. Yeah, so um, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, questions about chloroquine as well. So here is one review I found uh, particularly useful. It went through the data on chloroquine for a number of different viral uh, diseases and basically said it has some in vitro activity against SARS, it has some in vitro activity against coronavirus, human coronavirus in mice. It had no effect in a study in Vietnam. Um, it was effective ex vivo, but not in vitro for Ebola. In chikungunya in vitro, it really looked like it was suppressing viral activity, but when they actually gave it to patients, it made them worse. And in HIV, uh, chloroquine is inconclusive. So we do not have any direct data about whether in SARS-CoV-2 chloroquine works, although this morning you may have heard some people saying this is uh, the breakthrough that we've been looking for. We absolutely do not have information on this. And although it might look good in vitro, uh, the chikungunya question is really concerning that maybe it could make things worse. So although I know a lot of hospitals are using it, and I think it's not unreasonable in sick patients, uh, we really need to study this and randomize it very quickly to get any information. I'm going to try Dave Sh uh, Talon again. Dave, are you out there? Is your mic Can working? you hear me? Yes. What do you think? Oh, my gosh. Okay. Did you get the answer about um, when employees can go back to work? No, finish that and then talk about chloroquine. Right. So go to the CDC website, everybody, and you can see there's there's two paths. One is fever resolution, improvement of respiratory symptoms, and two PCR tests 24 hours apart. And the other is symptom-based, uh, provided the fever's gone for three days and you're more than seven days from the onset of the illness. So that's the official CDC policy. And I agree with you, Mel, that uh, that is the background on Clarquin. And the, you know, there's sort of rumor and innuendo that it was effective in SARS-1, but I am not aware of any published clinical trial data, and we need that. There was a Chinese letter uh, from a physician that said they did a study in 10 hospitals and 100 patients and chloroquine worked great. They didn't present the data. It wasn't, there was nothing there. It was just sort of this letter. And that's also created some hysteria. I believe right now in France, there is some data that potentially is coming in the next few days. But again, uh, caution. You can't buy chloroquine anymore anyway. This has become an internet meme and everywhere is sold out. So it's kind of crazy times. Well, supposedly Bayer had quite a bit of it. And uh, the more tolerable form is hydroxychloroquine, which is plaquiquin, which is also anti-inflammatory, right? It's used in autoimmune disease. And since, you know, cytokine storm and inflammation seems to be part of severe disease, I, I think these drugs hold some promise and they should be studied. I also hear that they're being hoarded in Europe 
and um, you know maybe that'll add to the list of toilet paper and now uh, acetaminophen. I gotta get People my. People will be trying to hoard chloroquine too. <laughs> I gotta get my booze, my toilet paper, my chloroquine. I got it. Yep. Yep. Um, this actually came up in uh, for me before uh, tonight and in the chat room here. So. A subset of these patients get very sick. They look septic by usual criteria. They are septic by usual criteria. Uh, can you give us some color as to what you think we should be covering these people with in terms of antimicrobials? Maybe they're co-infected with bacteria as well. So a number of people are asking this question. Yeah, you know, I, I looked very carefully and searched for anything that talked about bacterial um, uh, co-infection or secondary infection, and I could find nothing. But I think for patients who are so sick that they're going to the ICU and they are at absolutely increased risk of getting secondary bacterial infections, if not of their lung, which of course we have a model for that in influenza and staph and pneumococcal are severe, um, you know, they're also instrumented. They have lines, they have urinary catheters. Um, I don't see the downside risk being that great, and I would I would cover them broadly, um, no different than I would cover someone broadly who, who is um, severely ill, just generally in the um, in the intensive care unit. I mean, I think it'll be a lucky day if they survive. Some of these people survive long enough to get C diff infections. So, but there there's no good data on bacterial infections in these patients that I'm aware of. Great. So I'm just looking at the tech team. Did we crash? Yep. So let's reboot. Was it me? Yeah. 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 We get the. We're gonna take about five minutes to reboot here. You know, There's it's so funny. Like yeah. this. The. Right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Uh, sorry, we have to reboot. Um, can we bring up uh, the audio for the Zoom? And I'll can you talk to Dave some more. So, uh, Dave Talon, we are back. We are back streaming. Can you just re-summarize that antimicrobials in the sick intubated patient? Yes. Yeah, so you you asked me about that, and I said I can't. I couldn't find any information, any literature on that yet. I think people who are sick enough to be in the ICU should be covered with broad spectrum antibiotics based on general principles, because we're certainly aware of uh, secondary bacterial pneumonias related to viral pneumonias like influenza. And these patients uh, are obviously at high risk for bacterial infections from instrumentation, Foley catheters, intravenous lines, and um, you know they're very high risk. So I think I, think I would cover uh, severely ill COVID-19 patients, broad spectrum, and um, hopefully we'll have more data soon. Great. Uh, something just came up in the chat room that I know Jess can uh, speak to. Jess, the question is, uh, what is the current recommendations, thoughts around uh, pregnant providers and their risk uh, to the unborn? Can you sort of summarize that from um, the chapter? Yes. So the theme here is that there's very limited data about everything, of course. But there is one case series that looked at, at nine patients who were pregnant and delivered babies while infected with COVID. And the great news there is that they all did very well. So there wasn't vertical transmission. And furthermore, in six of those patients, they were able to, to test the uh, breast milk at first lactation, and the virus was not detected in breast milk. 
And so the recommendation from the World Health Organization and the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine is that if a woman who is breastfeeding um, has COVID-19, she can continue to breastfeed. Um, now, I, I wanna say another caveat. Um, in, in comparison to COVID-19, pregnant patients who have been infected with SARS and MERS have had pretty concerning outcomes with their pregnancies. Um, they've gotten more severe illness. The, the mother has gotten more severe illness. And also there's been higher rates of preterm labor and fetal demise. And so it, it, we absolutely can't base recommendations off a case series of nine patients. And so I think that anyone who's pregnant, I would consider that person to be a high risk group and should be very closely followed by their obstetrician and perhaps maternal fetal medicine as well. Uh, Heidi James and the crew at Right on Prime uh, did a nice little summary of this today, breaking news. So um, it's on your MRAP app. You can go check it out under the Right on Prime section. Uh, really, really nice review, basically saying uh, what Jess has just stated here. So uh, back to Dave Tallon. Um, during the SARS epidemic and the MERS epidemic, they took convalescent sera plasma and they gave sick people um, this uh, sera because it had all the antibodies in there. Can you summarize uh, what happened there and is there hope for this as a treatment for the SARS COVID 2? Uh, yeah, so there, there's a pretty positive history using convalescent serum in treating viral illness that goes back actually to the Spanish flu in 1918, up through treatment of polio victims, um, other influenza uh, epidemics, and, and, and positive results, as you allude to, and let's call it SARS-1. So um, I think it's something that we will see. We will certainly have a population of people who survive and have hy hyperimmune serum, uh, which could be given to patients who have severe COVID-19 infection. Uh, obviously, it is something that requires scientific study uh, through a randomized design. There are potential uh, there are potential dangers. Uh, the danger of transmitting other infection, I think, is is mostly, you know, eliminated because of our our current techniques to screen plasma. But um, there is this theoretical idea that if you give someone someone else's antibodies to get over their current infection, that it may inhibit them developing their own protective immunity, which could make them more susceptible in the future to a an, another infection. So um, I, I think that would sum up what we know right now, but it, it looks like a, a, a uh, potentially useful approach. So do you want to do your joke about the convalescent homes? I don't think I don't think this is a subject where we can joke easily, Dr. Herbert. Yeah, he had but a go great ahead. joke. He had a great joke. That, um, Mel and I said that um, soon, if there's survivors in nursing homes, that we'll be able to uh, harvest our convalescent serum actually at convalescent homes. I never put those two terms together, but um, yeah. so that is it is interesting data. But we won't be able to do that for some time. I don't know the technologies behind that. How how quickly, you know, we're, we'll start having patients survive this. And I don't know how quickly you can go from you've got a survivor with lots of antibodies to creating something that you can actually go and inject in people. So we'll ask some pathologists and get back to you uh, about that. Um, uh, this is sort of an epidemiologic question. Uh, in a flu epidemic, in the middle of a flu epidemic, if you look like you have flu, you've got flu. Um, at what point can we say that with COVID? Um, and this is sort of an unanswerable question, but there'll be some point, right, where this is so prevalent. If you've got uh, symptoms of a cold, it's COVID-19. Is that right? Yeah, I, th I think so. I, I mean, th obviously things will change. Just like we talk about testing for influenza and the use of that wimpy drug Tamiflu, um, you know, if we ha have effective therapy for this, it will be important to know, not just epidemiologically, but specifically. Um, on the other hand, uh, like we, like Dave Schrager and I was talking about testing, you know, for most people who are healthy and if there's no concerns about vulnerable people in close proximity, um, you know, we might as well just assume they could have COVID-19 if uh, uh, it won't change what we do. 
So I'm going to ask you another unanswerable question, and Dave and Jess, you can jump in as well. Um, it still looks like the mortality in Italy is substantially higher than other places. And of course, it's about you know testing. and uh, But I think we've got a lot more data this week than we did last week, and the mortality is still very high. Any thoughts about why that might be? I know that Dave Schreiger has one potential possibility. Um, right. Go ahead, and, uh, Dave. You take it. Sure, I'll, I'll start. And, and I thank uh, Eric Savitsky on faculty with me for passing me some of this data. But there have been a number of studies of the number of ICU beds per person or per 100,000 people in various countries. And interestingly enough, if you look at Germany right now, and I assume everybody uh, listening to this knows about the Johns Hopkins world map that's tracking the number of cases, the number of uh, people who've uh, recovered and the number of people who've passed on by country worth taking a look at. Um, and you look at Germany right now, and they're up to about almost 15,000 positive tests, and they have something like 30 deaths, maybe 40 deaths. So they're at about 0.2 to 0.3 uh, percent mortality. And then you look at a country that practically borders them, Italy, and the numbers look very, very different with much higher mortality rates. And we see that in many countries. So the question is, what's the difference? Um, and um, one of the things that's been positive is, posited is Germany has the highest number of ICU beds uh, per population at a rough just under 30 per 100,000. Uh, other countries, Italy has about half that at 12. England has five or six beds per 100,000. We probably have somewhere between 20 and 25, but they're not equally dispersed. So they're areas of the country which are much lower and areas of the country which are much higher. So the, the average may not mean all that much. So one possibility is that just Germany had the capacity to handle the patients they're getting. And with good ICU care, more people are surviving or they're still on ECMO 15 days into their course and they just haven't died yet. We'll have to see what their numbers do over the next couple of weeks. But um, it's an interesting question to know, is this a function of the populations? Is this a function of the viral load that people are getting? Or is this a function of the capacity of the healthcare system to um, fix people who are severely ill? And I think yeah, from as we've been saying all along, the theme is just said is we don't have enough data and we don't know. Yeah, there's. it's also been suggested that well, maybe Italians have a particular gene that this virus likes or that they have a pretty old population there. Um, I'm hearing in the chat room that they're saying like 23% of the population is over the age of 65. I don't know if that's a lot different from Germany, but it's hard to imagine that the German population is radically younger than the Italian population, uh, but maybe that's part of it as well. So we don't know yet. Part of this mortality um, a question that has come up here is, uh, what about this myocardi myocarditis syndrome? There does appear to be a subset of people that are developing myocarditis, um, and we don't know exactly how often that is. Amal Matu in particular is interested in that. He's following it. Um, we just, again, unfortunately don't have a bunch of data. Um, Dave, do you, while I've still got you here, can you tell us about uh, that fomite study in the hospital? So you, you go to the hospital and you don't want to get infected and you're pretty good about you know, looking after yourself from the patient, but they found that in other places as well, this virus gets around. Again, another preprint server study, not peer reviewed, not yet published in an academic journal but they swab different areas of the ER for virus. And uh, the two places that were hotspots, uh, the printer and the hand disinfectant dispenser, which you know is touched by everybody, typically when you think your hands may be dirty. So it's not surprising you'd find virus on that. So if you uh, show up for your shift and your routine is to grab a Clorox wipe and clean the keyboard and clean the mouse and clean the desk under those things, uh, you may want to add to that the printer and uh, whichever hand disinfectant dispensers you happen to use as part of your ritual. I think I'll start doing that uh, the next time out. We've got a question here, which um, is a larger discussion, but they ask, should immunosuppressed uh, physicians, clinicians uh, work right now? And um, I think every hospital is going to have to decide for themselves. Each individual person is going to have to decide for themselves. I've seen some amazing random acts of kindness from our profession. Young docs uh, stepping up and saying, look, I'm young. I have no medical problems. My chance of getting hurt from this is significantly less than you old docs. Let me take your shifts. Maybe you can pay me back later. Um, and I think everybody has to decide for themselves. But it is true in an aging specialty and emergency medicine is starting to age that we have a lot of clinicians over 60 
with comorbid uh, diseases. And I guess it's part of the question is, where should we be using these clinicians? Should they be screening behind windows with iPads or should they be at the front line? And I think everybody has to decide for themselves where you fit on that spectrum. But it is very, um, it's amazing to see these young docs saying, I'll do 20 shifts, I'll do 25 shifts this month because I don't want my old friends, like Dave Schreiger here, to get something terrible and uh, from um, these patients. So, and for the same for the pregnant patients, pregnant physicians, I think you have to really put that into your algorithm. And know, another question here was about uh, <laughs> infants under the age of one. Uh, what do we know? Well, all we know so far is that the mortality under the age of nine is still hovering around zero. I'm sure it won't stay at zero, but kids under the age of nine appear to be particularly protected. Dave, do you think that they're not getting it? Do you think that they're immune from it? Could they be carriers? What's the latest from seven days ago? I, I, uh, Dave Talon, right? Yeah, Dave Talon. Yeah, too many Daves here. Um, <laughs> Drive me crazy. There was a, a large series published in pediatrics. I think it came from China. And then there were some severely ill children. It's very uncommon. It's not zero, Mel. And uh, it tended to occur in the preschool and younger children. But again, it was a very small percentage um, overall. So kids seem to be safe, protected. There are, like I said last week, there's some theories that they're more exposed to the typical coronaviruses that might give them some immunity to uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, it may be that the uh, that their expression of viral receptors is different than in adults. So I don't think we know, but it's a good thing that kids don't seem to get infected as often. They have better prognosis. The one thing, though, I think in that series that they found was that when kids did get the infection, they more often had mild disease and upper respiratory tract symptoms. So I think we got the impression from the initial reports in China that this was a lower respiratory tract presentation. Uh, but there were kids with the sniffles and little bits of sore throat and sinus congestion. Uh, and that was their manifestation of COVID-19. They also seemed to poop it out. Um, or at least you can find it in their poop with PCR tests. Now, whether that is, you know, uh, you know, you find it by PCR, you don't know that if, if it's in infectious secretions or not, and you know whether that's in, important in propagating uh, this infection in a community, I don't think is well understood. Um, and, and with that, people debate, you know, uh, how much sense it makes to close schools. Not every country has decided that that is the strategy they want to use. I think, um, I mean, Mel, you're very well versed in this. I think in England, they have not closed the schools. Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know exactly uh, the situation in England, but um, yeah, there, there's. It's just a controversial thing about whether you need to close schools. Uh, some people saying yes because those kids are just going to pass it uh, between each other. They're going home and they're infecting the families, and others saying, well, since they're protected, it's not as big a deal. I don't uh, know the right thing to do. I'm. There's a number of critical care topics that I think we're going to do next week. We're going to get some critical care experts on here. Stuff about the use of high-flow nasal O2 and non-invasive ventilation and are we volatizing and uh, this virus more? Is this a problem? I can tell you right now, just as summary for that, that the WHO is not sure. They're saying being cautious. Um, it doesn't seem like it's too high a risk. Uh, when you cough and sneeze, you've got, you're blowing stuff out at about 400 liters per minute. And when we're doing this high flow nasal stuff, it's maybe 30 liters per minute. So it may not be a big deal. But any time that you're ventilating a patient or having lots of oxygen or nebulizers, you're probably putting more of it into the air. And since it's a droplet spread, it probably does increase your little uh, things a little bit. Um, another question here in the chat room is about the use of ultrasound as screening, maybe in triage. We don't know yet. Uh, there's certainly a lot of pulmonary disease. The Chinese study showed lots of people with CT scan findings. Um, it takes an hour or two to clean the scanner between each patient, so scanning with CT scanner is a bad idea. But maybe at some point there'll be a strategy for Dave's magic pulse ox and then maybe some uh, ultrasound. We don't know. There's real concerns that we are not going to have enough ventilators. I know people are working overtime. Um, in the textbook, we put in this four ventilator setup. 
uh, Rebecca Badcock uh, did a, a paper on this about uh, 2006. This is her and it's a video that you can find on YouTube. We have a link in the textbook. If things get desperate, there are ways to ventilate multiple patients. The idea here is you take about uh, four people that are about the same ideal body weight and you ventilate them with one ventilator. This is in the extreme. Um, our critical care authors and reviewers really want people to understand this is the last ditch effort when you've got nothing else because the key thing to looking after people with sick lungs is to be able to look at their numbers and make sure that you don't overventilate them. And this makes that extraordinarily difficult. They also remind us that there are these little tiny uh, ventilators that potentially are coming soon. And also there are studies on people with just a peep valve and an Ambu bag that have been bagged like that for up to 18 days. So there's other things we can do as well. We'll talk more about that with our infectious diseases experts, I mean our ID, uh, critical care experts later. So just before we finish, this was something that came out of the New England Journal today. And it's just sort of a, a piece that was about, am I at risk or of hurting my family? Here I am working on the front lines, I'm getting covered in virus, and then I'm going home. Uh, I'm really scared about that. What should I do? So we've heard reports of docs basically saying they go to work, they come home, they get to the back door, they strip naked, they put all their clothes in a bag, they throw it in the washing machine, they head to the shower, they then move into the house. Um, and people who are saying, look, I'm, I live with somebody who's really immune compromised during this time, I'm not going to live with them. I'm going to go live in a motel. So first off with you, Dr. Talon, uh, got any thoughts for this for our healthcare providers, how they can reduce the chance of bringing this home? Well, all the things that we've talked about to, to use protection and screen patients, um, uh, goes a long way, but you know, stuff happens at work and you may get exposed through some accident, and then you have to consider uh, the nature of the exposure, the person, the source. Soon you'll be able to test the person just like a needle stick and determine if the source is positive, at least on that one test. Uh, you'll understand the, the risk, the epidemiologic risk of the source and the community. And then, um, um, you know, you'll be able to determine uh, maybe after that uh, whether or not you're getting symptoms. And, and then finally, um, you have to think about where you're going home to and is there someone there that is more susceptible? What's the nature of your living situation? Are you sharing the same room? Do you have to share the bathroom and the kitchen? Who are you living with and what's their risk? In most cases, people can home quarantine very safely. And the really good news is it's pretty easy to, to do simple things to distance yourself and be diligent about washing your hands. And so that the chance that you could, if you got the infection transmitted to someone, you can minimize that. But there may be special circumstances, epidemiologic through testing, including testing for, for other types of viral infections in the person who exposed you or later yourself, where you may decide, you know, home quarantine isn't, isn't enough um, because of the people who are vulnerable around you. So uh, let's uh, bring up the slide. I just want to show you one last thing. I think we're going to end it here. Um, a couple of our producers had this idea that what they would like to do is get a whole bunch of ER docs um, at hospital or at home, um, going through and telling the people where they're from and where they work and what they'd like people to do, which is basically if you're um, sick, stay home unless you're really sick, then come to the hospital. So um, we're going to put this information up on our website. If you want to be involved in this, you'll just take your iPhone, you'll make a little video, you'll follow some of the um, suggestions that are in this uh, Google Doc. But if we got uh, hundreds and hundreds of these, I think it would make a really interesting video that we could use as a public service announcement. So I want to thank our experts, Jess Mason, 
Dave Talon, Dave Schroeger, thanks for coming. Um, if you out there in internet land want us to keep doing these live events, we'll keep doing them, so let us know. I was thinking next week that we should do some critical care stuff because we'll probably have moved to that part of the curve where we're seeing a lot of critical care patients about how to intubate the patients and with what and uh, all of the PPE stuff that we need to know and much more. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thanks for watching. To our experts, thank you. And uh, be safe out there. Wash, glove, mask, get naked when you get home, shower, do what you got to do, protect your family. Talk to you soon. Thank you.